and really kind of the keystone verse, the tee up verse about this section of comfort is verse uh, five, because it's the one that asserts the topic, which is the righteous judgment of God. Verse five in the REV says, it's evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you will be counted worthy of the kingdom for which also you are suffering. So remember we talked last week that there was evidence that, that if you think of God in the courtroom and you've got all of these things and there's evidence provided. So last week, the evidence was stated briefly, which is it's righteous for God to repay with affliction those who are afflicting you and to give relief to those of you who are being afflicted. That's the evidence stated briefly. Tonight, we're going to look at the evidence stated more fully. And we really began that last week. I would call that in verse 7b, where, in, where, where the scripture states, when the Lord Jesus has revealed from heaven with his powerful angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. We kind of left off right in mid thought. That was where we left off. And we pick up tonight in verse nine. So verse nine says, they will pay the penalty of everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his strength. And I'll stop there for a moment. So Jerry, my, my cohort, has joined us. And um, Jerry, you ready to go for tonight? Sir, let's get going, Jeff. All right. All right. So, well, let's just start right here because in verse nine, there's a couple of biggies here in verse nine. And the first one that comes up for me is, is uh, they will pay the penalty. What? does that mean they will pay the penalty well this is a part of uh, the ongoing discourse that paul has been talking about in the righteous judgment of god as you just mentioned jeff back in like verse five well the righteous judgment of god is part that god is going to repay these tormentors of the thessalonian church with affliction he's going to repay them with affliction because they are afflicting his people. And then he further states that this is going to happen when Jesus comes from heaven and on account of, on behalf of God, he takes vengeance against those people who, who do not know God and who do not obey the good news. So he's going to repay these people with affliction. He's going to take vengeance upon them, but it's never really kind of specified. And so he, he says it a third time here that they're going to pay this penalty. Well, I, I do want to point out that these words like righteous in the righteous judgment and in the word here for vengeance and also the word here for penalty. You, you can't see this in the English text, but these are all derivatives of the same uh, lexical family of words in Greek. Uh, they all deal with justice, as you've been saying. And as a matter of fact, this word here for penalty, um, it's, it's just DK. It, it means justice. It is the word for justice. And in the Greco-Roman world, uh, DK was the name of the god for justice, just like the word Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. So DK is, is referring to justice. So what, what Paul is saying here is that these individuals, they're going to pay this penalty, but you could render this as that um, they will suffer the punishment of divine justice. They, they, they will have to undergo God's justice. And that happens at the judgment. Now, Jeff, if somebody is a criminal, um, why do they run from the law? generally because they've done something wrong <laughs> and if they get caught they're going to be taken to court and what will be served justice will be served hopefully on a silver platter That's in a righteous right. world yeah so uh this is a 
a great way, I think, for Paul to, he's just driving home this point for the Thessalonians. You know, and we've talked a lot about the whole purpose here, Jeff, right, is, is all about trying to comfort the Thessalonians and explain their circumstances so that they don't grow weary and lose heart, but are able to endure with perseverance. Well, so Jerry, it looks like here, is Paul now finally spelling out this justice where it says they pay the penalty, everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. Like, are, are they being, what is that all about? What is this everlasting destruction and, and where are they going anywhere? Are they being sent somewhere? Yeah, I think Paul does get to the point here, kind of the, as you mentioned, he gets, he finally talks about what do these, what do the bad people have coming to them? You know, what is this justice? What does it really look like? Well, he's, he does spell it out, everlasting destruction. I mean, this, this word just sounds pretty, pretty rough, everlasting destruction. It's not just destruction. <laughs> there's like uh, an adjective that makes it like even, you know, more daunting. It's everlasting. Now, you know, the scriptures talk about the, the end for though the enemies of God, what will, what is their ultimate destiny? And their ultimate destiny is to be destroyed, to be burned up, to be thrown into the lake of fire, to suffer the second death. And that they're going to be unable to escape this. This is the justice that, that they are going to be weighed against and will have to suffer. This, they will have to pay this penalty. Now, the question you raised, Jeff, and I, I think it's legitimate is, well, why does it then say that this destruction happens away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his strength? Is it as though the destruction you know, has to happen like around the corner so that the, the, the believers don't see it? You know, like, is God trying to hide their punishment? You know what? It's sort of a, a weird phrase, isn't it? It is. It is kind of weird. And this, I mean, this word presence, it seems to come up actually several times in these couple of verses. Plus, I think it's come up again, or at least the thought of it uh, came up in First Thessalonians. So what what is this all about away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his strength? Yeah, I think Paul is trying to spell out um, in terms that Co uh, coalesce with uh, some of his other themes in the letter, and especially themes previously in First Thessalonians, that the idea of everlasting destruction is the counterpart to being raised to everlasting life. You know, and when you're raised to everlasting life, you know, Paul talks about this in First Thessalonians chapter four. You know, the Lord is going to descend from heaven with the shout, trumpet of God, and everything. And what's going to happen? The dead in Christ are going to rise, and the people who are alive, um, who trust in Christ, are going to be gathered together with them and meet the Lord in the air. So they're going to be transformed into uh, having everlasting life, and they will be with the Lord forever. Paul is now stipulating the opposite of that. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel or the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ— they're going to suffer the opposite of what believers have. He, he, this is part of that divine retribution theme that you, I think you mentioned in a previous session of ours. And so while uh, you, people might construe that the destruction is simply that they're going to you know, be put somewhere else to live out their eternal life, uh, that's not the point that Paul's trying to make with this descriptor. The idea that they're going to be banished from the Lord is the counterpart to the believers being united to the Lord. And this is basically for Paul, this is like, this is the worst outcome and circumstance for anyone, any, cre any part of creation to ever be subjected to, to be cast away from the presence or this, this word, you know, in the Greek is actually from the face of the Lord and away from the glory of his strength. Uh, it's, well, it's almost though like uh, he's trying to explain how much of a, a deprivation 
this is going to be for them and, and how dr drastic this punishment is. Well, you know, one of the things that comes up for me, Jerry, is sometimes people think, well, the, you know, this is all um, God's doing it. Like God is the one that is deciding this, but it just occurs to me, and I forget if there's, if the Greek uh, supports this, it's really, it's the choice, God is simply giving them the choice they chose to uh, not want anything to do with God for their life. They chose to reject God in life, and and really, this is this is really honoring their choice and their free will that they had to reject God is that He would be rejected for everlasting destruction. They they will they will they will get what they wanted in life, which was nothing to do with God. Is that is that in here as a part of that? Yeah, I think that's I think that here you know the idea that they don't know God. Um, here and that they don't obey. So you're right. They, by their life choices and by their refusal to surrender or submit to the authority of God or the rule of God, you could say, in his kingdom, uh, they are choosing to suffer this sort of justice that has come into them. They're choosing to, to eventually find themselves uh, forever excluded from being able to experience the presence of the Lord and his glory. You know, to be saved, as um, we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, part of that salvation is that we're saved from the judgment of God's wrath, which is against unbelievers. You know, so to be saved means to, to be exempt from, from God's wrath and to be in the Lord's presence and to share in his glory. And thus to be destroyed, to suffer everlasting destruction, that is to then be in a state of, un, of inability to enjoy that blessed union with the Lord. Amen. Well, is, so is there anything extra on this glory of the strength that you've, is that, what's, what is that talking um, about? Yeah, I think that you, you could like probably, um, it could also be something like, um, his glorious strength. Um, the Greek here can be construed a couple different ways, uh, but the point that Paul's uh, he's bringing is these two things. He's bringing being in the presence or being with the Lord and being able to be in the glory of the Lord and to share in that glory. And that's, that's something that Paul talks a, a lot about. Um, he talks about being able to share in the glory when Christ returns. I mean, he even says in uh, one of his letters, uh, things to the Colossians, that when Christ appears, who is our life, then we will appear with him in glory. You know, so it's, it's about being able to experience the Lord's glory. First, his glory, and then being able to be part of that because of our union with him. So I think that Paul's doing a, a double duty here of saying, you're not gonna be with the Lord, and you're going to miss out on the most blessed aspect promised to those who are his. Wow. I mean, this promise is so important. It's so important. And it seems so important for the Thessalonians to stay, stay with it through the hardships that they focus on the future, that they have that hope. And, and that's where <clears throat> verse 10 again seems to state again a, a reminder that it's on that day when he comes to be glorified in the presence of his holy ones and to be marveled at in the presence of all those who believed. And then we have that funny uh, parentheses we can talk about. So, <laughs> yeah. so, but he really seems to be uh, emphasizing that day, reminding them when this righteous judgment of God is going to happen on the day of the Lord. Yeah, I think, you know, this is uh, interesting here if we see, you know, Paul talks about when the Lord is revealed from heaven and he takes vengeance, he's speaking about the destiny of the unbelievers. But now here he's, he, he talks about the penalty they're going to they're gonna pay on that day but on that day, he now focus, he switches to his focus. He switches his focus now on what he's coming to do for his people, for believers. So on that day when the Lord comes, 
unbelievers are going to get what's coming to them. They're going to be destroyed. And when he comes, though, if you are one of his, he comes to be glorified in the presence of his holy ones and to be marveled at in the presence of all those who believe. I mean, I mean that is something that I think we all look forward to, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that it what it what it looks like again, Jerry, is it's he keeps going back and forth from the 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 negative judgment on the persecutors and then the positive judgment on those who are being persecuted, the believers in this case. Mm -hmm. And so he, he's it's the, the same event that brings justice, the negative to the unbeliever and the positive to the believer. And the focus is on that day. <laughs> now, this, uh, let, let me uh, say one thing real quick about this presence thing. Because you, you brought up that there's this, um, you know, there's a presence here, presence here. Uh, we inserted the word presence for the sake of the ellipsis that we think is happening here. I was going to ask you about that because you guys, you did insert it in the RV. Yeah. Because it, it's hard when you say like, he comes to be glorified in his holy ones. It's not clear what sort of a, a nuance that preposition in, you know, how, how are they, how is the Lord going to be glorified in his holy ones? And another point to make here, I think, um, you know, Back in First Thessalonians chapter 3, when he comes, it says he comes with his holy ones from heaven. But there, as we saw uh, previously, that's likely referring to the angel armies of heaven that the Lord is going to come with. And I think that corresponds to his powerful angels up here in verse 7 that he's going to come with from heaven. But down here, when he comes to be glorified in the presence of his holy ones, the meaning of this word shifts. And I think he's now going back and he's speaking about believers here being the holy ones of God. And so he's coming to be glorified in the presence of his holy ones. And this also harkens back to the uh, time of the Lord's return in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when he comes from heaven and then he uh, raises up all of, all of his people and they join him together in the air. So he is, he is glorified together with the believers in the air in 1 Thessalonians 4. And not only to be glorified, uh, he says that, that he's to be marveled at. When was the last time you marveled at something, Jeff? The last time I even saw that word is I was a big fan of Marvel comics rather than DC. I was a Marvel fan. So I don't know, is this, is this anything to do like with Marvel comics? What does that word mean? Yeah, Marvel, you know, it's, we think of it in English, like, um, when, when you see something really amazing, right, you, you marvel at it. And it's, it's maybe, uh, like, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but when the way that Paul is using this in the sense of uh, this, you could say, eschatological or end times apocalyptic type of language here, uh, this has more not to do with amazement or astonishment, but it, it's more the notion of ascribing honor to him and, and glory it, such that it, it's, it's like a description of a posture of worship. I mean, we're not going to be, the point is not that we're going to be standing there with our mouth open, just like marveling at, you know, the, the glory of the Lord, even though that probably will happen. <laughs> You know, it, it's more about a posture of the heart of just being filled with awe and wonder and, and just uh, being so overwhelmed by his majesty. It just, it just, to me, brings up, it's a day that we all want to be a part of. And we can't even imagine what that day will be like and what that must have meant to the believers when they were under great duress to know what a glorious day that will be, uh, had to be, has to bring great comfort, not just to them, but to us when we're going through hard times. Yeah. So Jeff, here at the end, he, he puts in that this is going to happen in the presence of his holy ones and all those who believe. I think these are parallel. Then what is this little thing on the end here? This includes you because our testimony to you is believed. 
it sounds like it's a little bit redundant. What, what do you think that's supposed to function as? Why, why did you put that there? Yeah, to to me, Jerry, this is this is about Paul emphasizing over and over again that they fall on the positive side of this ledger, that he's reminding them again in all of this that he's going to be that in the presence. In the presence of his of uh, when Jesus comes to be glory, glorified in the presence of his holy ones, in the presence of all those who believed, and then by the way, this includes you, because our testimony to you was believed. So it just seems to me again he's making painfully clear that they're going to be a part of this glory when Jesus Christ comes and therefore not to be worried, not to be anxious, not to be concerned because he's doubling down that their, their salvation is assured because of their, uh, because they follow Jesus because he is their Lord. Um, how'd I do? You're the, you're the guys that put in the parentheses. So what else is in there? What am I missing? No, that's, that's mainly it. It's, it's sort of if you want to um, make someone feel special, you know, you, you really want to know that you're thinking about it, and you 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 write a letter. Um, do you do you put any personal touches on the letter? You know, ways that you kind of like, you know, sort of uh, tell them, you know, you really mean a lot to me, and, and I remember these special things, and and I want to let you know these particular, you know. Uh, uh, things I admire about you or stuff like that. I think that's what Paul's doing here. You know, he, he's he's basically saying, um, oh, hey, by the way, this includes you. If you didn't know <laughs> that, um, you know, I've been talking, you know, with you in mind this whole time. I and mean, it seems to us probably obvious that when he says, you know, that the Lord's going to come to be glorified in his holy ones, he's going to come to be marveled at in the presence of all those who believe that the Thessalonians would just implicitly know that they're included in that group. Well, Paul doesn't want to give any room for doubt here. And so it's almost like he's basically doing a little personalized PS script at the bottom. Hey, I want you to know that this is you because you believed our testimony. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Well, that so so if I could if I could just recap this whole section we've been on last week and this week this comfort section that this whole thing, Jerry. To me, it just seems it's the motive, Paul's motive, which is obviously God's motive in the, in the inspiration of the letter, is to reassure the Thessalonian believers that they belong to the group where the righteous judgment of God involves glorification and salvation rather than everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. And I love if that was Janet, whoever, whoever put that chat up, I think it was Janet. I think of that song, the words of that song that you put up there. Um, that would be exactly the song that would come to mind if I were going to try and summarize this section. So anyway, well, we'll so Jerry, should we move on to the prayer? Yeah, let's close out this chapter here. Okay, so so this here, we're now getting into the prayer section, which also, it closes out the chapter. It also closes out the whole Thanksgiving section that we've been on. So next week, we're going to be in, in a new section. So this one, I, I would say, Jerry, just overall, this is a prayer where Paul challenges them or he's praying for the believers, uh, for God to work in their lives, to challenge them to continue. And maybe we'll see that as we go along. So verse 11 says, and in view of this, we always pray for you that our God will count you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill every desire for goodness and every work motivated by trust. I think if we start there, there's a lot right in here just to get started. So that we'll always pray for you that God will count you worthy of his calling. 
Can we stop on that? Just yeah. Hey, Jeff, let, let me put, I can put something here, Jeff, that might help frame this section for us. Okay. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, the, the prayer has has two aims. Um, one, I think it. That's that's not. I'll do a better one there. Okay. Uh, the first thing is, I think it is Paul's trying to achieve two things. Um, he's trying to uh, he's trying to convey affection and concern, or you could say. Mm -hmm. um, trying to comfort them is concern for them as their life their circumstances of persecution but then you are right um he's trying he's trying to challenge them to live according to and we'll get we'll get to that to fill in the blank here in just a second <laughs> okay okay Beautiful. I like that. I, I, I like the way that summarizes there. So, so, so let's, let's talk about this, that our God will count you worthy of his calling, because that comes up. The calling, calling comes up quite a bit, uh, certainly comes up in the letter and, and worthy of the calling. So can we stop on that and, and reflect a little bit or about yeah. this worthy of calling. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill in the the blank because you just read it, and I think you know this his calling. Well, um, <laughs> there we go. So that he's challenging them to live according to God's calling. So God's calling. Exactly, and and uh, I see from Worker B there's a question about hey, doesn't verse five talk about this, and isn't this a little bit different? So why, yes, it certainly <laughs> does, doesn't it? Up here, it is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. So is this the same thing? Is it different? Well, it's actually not the only place that Paul even said this as well. We can even go back to his previous letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I remember he talked about um, like how he treats, he looks at them and treats them like a, a father treats their children. Um, and he's encouraging them to live a life of holiness uh, because he says that you're supposed to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So this idea of, of walking worthy, being counted worthy, these, these ideas, they tie together. Now, I think the parallelism between verse five and then here now in verse 11, I think is direct. The, the connection back to 1 Thessalonians 2, I don't think it's a direct illusion or connection. It's just the same idea is being expressed by Paul toward the Thessalonians in multiple places. Now, being counted worthy, oh, I'm sorry, go say something, Jeff? What, you well, I mind? was just going to ask, so, so this kind of worthy, he's praying that they would be counted worthy of their calling. I mean, does Paul doubt the salvation of the Thessalonians? Is that what he's praying about here? Um, uh, of course not. I mean, as we've read in the letter, the Thessalonian believers are the epitome <laughs> of, of faithful believers. I mean, it, Paul is, as we said before, so stinking proud of these guys. You know, like he, he got kicked out of town and left, and he is hearing about how their faith is growing. Um, they are enduring persecution. They are loving each other. I mean, no, they're not, they're not in like uh, Paul's mind. He's not concerned like, I don't know if you guys are there yet or not. No, that's not what he's trying to do by this. You know, it, it's more or less if you are trying to encourage somebody to continue in a course of action, you, you would uh, say it in an, in an affirmative way, you know, and, and Paul's prayer is for them to continue in the way that they are living for the Lord, in the way that they are loving each other. And his, his prayer is that they would just continue that way. And ultimately that God will count them worthy of his calling because that is what he wants for them. He wants them to live up to the measure of God's calling in their life. Now, well, he, he, he goes on, Jerry, to talk about two ways 
are these are these connected? Is part of that walking worthy? Because he talks about fulfilling every desire for goodness and every work motivated by trust. So is there a connection there? Is that is that part of that walking worthy by fulfilling every desire for goodness and every work of trust? Yeah, um, oh, that's not how it's spelled. So the grammatically here, you know, this prayer that Paul has is supposed to be, there's two um, objects that go with it, two, two clauses. You know, his prayer is for two things. One, that God will count the Thessalonians worthy of his calling. Secondly, that God will fulfill every desire for goodness and every work motivated by trust. So you know, we could say this is part one of the prayer, and then this is part two of the prayer, where this counting and fulfilling are the two actions God is, or Paul is praying for God to take toward the Thessalonians. Now, um, I, I think what you were asking about previously, what you were talking about the power part here, right? Did you bring that up? Yeah, so by his power fulfill. That looks important. It sounds like to me like God needs to be involved in, in this that he's asking for the believers to do. I mean, can we can we honestly really do anything apart from God? Like, are, are we are we able in ourselves to to really achieve anything actually significant and good? No, um, I, I would say no. Nah. We, we we are. We are uh, entirely dependent. We are entirely dependent upon God and his grace uh, to be able to carry out the function of the body for which we have been placed in. You know, to, to be able to exercise the way we've been uniquely uh, put into uh, Christ's body. Uh, we don't just have the innate ability to, to do what we're supposed to do. And so Paul definitely is, he's, he's pointing to the Lord God and saying that his prayer is that he, God, will count you guys worthy of his calling, that you will walk worthy of the calling you've been called by, and that God will continue to work in you so that he fulfills in you your desire for goodness and every work. This, this reminds me of a, another passage many of us might know. It's that um, that of uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It is God who both uh, who, who is working in you both to want to do and also to be able to do his good pleasure. You know, it's it's God working in us to be able to be able to fulfill, you know, God's will in our lives. And well, well this Jerry, this desire for goodness then. For him to fulfill every desire for goodness, can you talk a little bit more about what what that is all about? Yeah, the, the two things that Paul wants God to fulfill in the life of the Thessalonians is uh, desire for goodness and work motivated by trust. This good this goodness word here, desire for goodness. Uh, the idea of goodness, you know, it, it seems like kind of like an, it's an abstract notion. Um, what, what does goodness mean? Well, Jesus said that there is only one who is good, and that is God, our Father. And when we say something is good, it has to then derive from the divine intention or the divine will, plan, and purpose of God. Something cannot be good that is not in a line with God's purpose and his will. And so all this desire for goodness are things that fall in line with, uh, with God and with his character. You know, goodness, we could define it as um, you know, having a, a positive moral quality about yourself that stems from holiness and that issues in or, or produces in your life an interest in the well-being of others. It's not just goodness for goodness sake. It's goodness 
for others. You want good for others. I think this fulfills the, the second commandment of God that Jesus taught us, that uh, we are to love our neighbor as ourself from Leviticus 19.18. Uh, this desire for goodness can come in all kinds of forms. Um, when you think of something good that you think would honor God, Jeff, do you what comes to mind for you of, 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 an, of an act that honors God or, or maybe achieves uh, what God desires to be uh, in this world? Well, I mean, Jerry, just to use a, a little example, to me, it can, it can be a grandparent reading a story to a grandchild to put them to bed and loving them as, as simple as an act of goodness and love that manifests God's goodness for that child and helps them learn about God's love or just something simple as that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that um, in, when you're investing in the life of somebody else, I, I think that surely counts for goodness, especially, you know, I mean, as you're trying to promote uh, their awareness of the Lord or for them to help them and prepare them for when they get older, that they would accept the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart and, and come into a relationship with God. That's definitely something, you know, a desire for goodness. I also, you know, for myself, I, I think a desire for goodness would be to, to show love to other people. And it can be as simple as when you're at uh, the grocery store, and if you see somebody who maybe seems down, depressed, or, or, or frustrated, or something like that, you know, I've, I've just gone up and said hi to somebody, and said, you know, God bless you, uh, you know, I hope you have a wonderful night, you know, I, I'm just, I just, I want, I want their, their uh, day to turn around, I want them to be able to not be suffering under whatever is going on for them, you know, it's just a, a it's a general desire and interest for other people to, to, uh, for their well-being and, and for their overall health, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, you know, physically, all of that. That's that's beautiful. And then, if if you tie that, Jerry, I think of the second part that you've underlined here. That there's oh, a yeah. We, we've heard a, this. We've heard this line before, haven't we, Jerry? Yeah, the work motivated by trust. Because, and it was what you pointed out in Philippians that one is the desire, even to want to do good things. And then the other is to actually do them. It's work. It's the actions or the activities and those activities motivated by trust. And this, this was all over First Thessalonians, wasn't it? All the way from the first prayer in First Thessalonians 1.3 that he thanked God for their work motivated by trust. And I, I think of this one, Jerry, like you were talking about in the grocery store or anywhere I, I I find myself asking, is this, is what I'm doing now, am I trusting the Lord in what I'm doing now, or am I anxious, am I full of fear, am I this, or am I that, versus, and, and in fact, one of the questions I sometimes ask myself when I'm, when I'm uh, anxious, or is, I ask myself, is this what trusting God feels like, or is this what trusting God Hey Jeff, does this look like? Does that feel like trust to you? And I, if it doesn't, then I have to remind myself: Well, what would trusting God feel like if I were trusting Him now? If I were trusting in the Lord, what would that feel like? What would that look like? How would I be thinking and doing and acting? And this really is a big theme in Thessalonians. And here we are again. And he's now he's asking. He's praying that by God's power, we would have this desire for goodness and that our activities would be motivated by our faith in our trust in the Lord and our faith in him. Yeah, it has really been a, a big theme of Paul's. And, and uh, I think he tags it on here uh, in order to just keep on weaving that thread, you know, throughout his letters. Let's, uh, let's move on here and we'll tackle this last verse of uh, the chapter here of this and this prayer here it says so the name of our lord jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our god and the lord jesus christ uh, so 
we see this glorification theme come up here again. Do you think that's a coincidence that it just seems to also be sprouting up time and time again? I think Paul is full of coincidences. I just think that's <laughs> that's kind of his his mo, Jerry. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, when when I think about well, is this something that is supposed to be future? You know, Paul Paul writes here that. It's so the name of the Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you and him. Is this about when Jesus returns? Is that one what Paul has in mind here? I, I think perhaps, but I don't want to overlook the fact that what we just talked about, Jeff, was that Paul's praying for God to do things in the lives of the Thessalonians here and now in the first century when he wrote to them. You know, there, there was an immediate uh, relevancy to them in this prayer. So uh, I think that while ultimately, you know, he is looking forward to the hope of Jesus' return, and when all these things are going to happen that he just described, I think that that maybe is the ultimate uh, view of Paul. I also think that there's a, a present aspect to it. Like when we, uh, when we do um, act on our desire to do good to others, when we do uh, good works that come from our faith or our trust, you know, that I, I think that does bring glory to the Lord Jesus. I think that honors him, you know. Uh, now, how can he be honored? Uh, how can we be honored in him at this time? I think that's a little uh, more difficult to ferret out. Uh, I definitely think he has the return of Jesus in mind primarily for that because when Jesus comes, that's when we will join with him in his glory, and we will be glorified with him. We will receive glorious bodies like his glorious body. But none of this is possible. Again, you know, power and grace, these ideas of God's power at work and the grace from God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we have both Jesus and God are at work in the world, giving grace to the church to carry out the purposes of the kingdom. And none of this is possible without them. You know, we, we would not, we would be uh, aimless ants wandering around, not knowing what, which way to go, what to do, if it weren't for the grace that we receive from them. I just, I love that, Jerry, that it, that it, in, in wrapping up this section, this, and this entire section of Thanksgiving, that it would be wrapped up uh, and here in this prayer that it's by his power and it's according to his grace. And that really is what our calling, you know, we, we have a calling, but all of it is by his power and it's according to his grace. And, and here again, just to summarize this prayer, which once again is bringing, it's bringing the affection and the love that Paul had for these believers and the comfort, the comfort that he's bringing to them. But at the same time, as always, Paul challenges them to keep at it, stay faithful. And, and I, what you're saying here in this glorified is that it, it seems that when we stay faithful, when we do good, when we, um, uh, endure and hang in there even in the hardship times well it glorifies him in the here and now but one day when he returns it's going to we're going to be glorified we're going to be rewarded just like the Thessalonians are going to be rewarded for their faithful stand That's and right. all of it is by his power and according to his grace hallelujah hallelujah well, Jerry, I think we'll. St I think that's all we'll do tonight. I think we'll wrap here, which actually will um, complete the Thanksgiving section, and next week we'll be launching into the main body of the letter in chapter two.